species of Obsidium. It's in the Matesi family. G'day folks, so we're uh, going to do a bit of uh, edibles learning today, learning about uh, native um, plants and what we can eat and uh, what we can use in the bush, so it should be interesting, something to learn, something new. Uh, Marshall here first and uh, get a bit of uh, coffee and cake while we wait, but yeah, it should be good. This is a um, edible walking tour um, about native, native plants and what we can eat, so see you soon. Very few plants that aren't useful, okay? Uh, even at the most fundamental level, a tree like this, and we'll talk about this tree in a second, all different uses of it, it's providing us shelter, okay? Even where you've got these grasses here, like Pash Palin and things like that, or whatever. Follow the leaves. Okay. You'll get your little stalk. Like so. Okay. You get your last. Oh, yeah. Oh! Have a shot if you want, but that's how you do it. It does work, it's basically like this. So, this is an older edition of the same book, all right. And you see, this one's a little bit thicker. What you'll find is sometimes things are discovered about plants, like you know, we know if they take it to the lab, they have a look at it, and think, oh, you know, we used to say think that was edible, but you know, now it's really high. It was discovered that it's got that toxin that it's really mm -hmm. carcinogenic. So. So, with books, yeah, so sometimes the information changes over time. This is quite an old book. This looks like an early edition from the 70s, late 70s. This is a relatively recent one. Uh, also, the binomial nomenclature will change. The botanical name will change over time, and that will lead to confusion. All right, so when you buy books for your reference library, which I would strongly recommend that you have, like, left a reference library of its five, six, seven books, always try to get up-to-date up, up editions, right? All right, one mm -hmm. or two years old. Okay. You gotta watch the cycle track. I don't want to anybody else. <laughs> Again, just a few common weeds. Yeah. So this is Funiculum vulgar or fennel. You can smell it straight away. Yeah. Mm. All right. So it's not Australian native. It's sort of European, Middle Eastern kind of thing. Uh, with the one you get in the wild, generally the bulb is too sort of fibrous. Too psychedelic, you could use a Swiss Army knife. So obviously, if I'm going to harvest some of this this wattle, right, to use uh, for the demonstration, if I just rip it and it's all like raggedy, obviously that allows you know different viruses, fungus, pathogens to get in the plant and potentially can kill the plant. So if you're going to do something like this, try and make a nice clean prun pruning cut. Uh, usually kind of like at a node area like this usually I use secateurs but so this one is acacia longifolia and you kind of want to use both hands to kind of go like this kind of thing yeah. so you got it can I have a oh, boil? So. I actually got coffee on my hands here, so. a little bit of yes is it a natural site? Yeah, it's good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's the saponins in the plant. Mm. Yeah. So, Lamandra longfolia has a few different common names. Spiky mat rush is probably the most common one. Mm. Uh, has a few different uses. Uh, it's probably one of the most common bush tucker plants you're going to find mm. in this area, okay? Uh, you have to be a little bit careful how you harvest it because sometimes this edge here can be sharp. It can actually give you a cut, like a paper cut. You can actually feel it. If you do that, you can feel it. Kind of wants to cut you. So how you harvest it is you go down to the base of the leaf, and then you want to sometimes pull or twist and pull, and do that. What you don't want to do is kind of do this thing, and then you will end up with a cut <laughs> in your hand. And what we're after is this one. So this is a little bit of carbohydrates. It's also like a little bit of water as well and just chew it right so so if you all want to have a go now you've had you've been told, told how to harvest it so you can use it for cordage as well 
but it derives the name Matt Rush because you would so you would make obviously this is just a quick mm -hmm. demonstration but obviously you could make a lattice like this you know for bedding or as a mat I suppose you could say but what I do is I do little ones like this I do like little ones that are just a few inches wide just as sometimes if we're in the bush and I'm cooking I'll just make a little one just as like mm -hmm. a put food on and stuff like that you know what I mean? mm -hmm. or, and you can make a bigger one you can like you know store food in it and keep supplies off it and stuff like that Portalaka, all the races literally kind of find us at yes. Mitchell and Star restaurants really <laughs> trendy ingredient really really highly nutritious this is the aloe they actually make the rope from yeah it's highly fibrous yeah. it's aloe rope common name yes in fact I can't remember how you pronounce it it's Cecil 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 rope which is uh, okay. if I remember correctly that's the species as well as well. Sometimes it's just hard to do. You get everybody watching you. So what we kind of want to do with this one is just get a few fibers. And you could dry this out. I don't know who showed me this. I can't remember. But I've known this for a long time. Fine. Mm -hmm. right, just for the purposes of the demonstration, mm -hmm. we just, you know, just chop it there. Obviously, you could keep that longer. So, basically, what you've got now is a needle and a thread. Mm. All right. Huh. All right. Cool. So you, you just want to do a quick, quick and dirty repair, you know. And you can use one, you can take one and use one as an awl and make the hole as well. And you can make a stitch. And you could do a better, better job just with making this like cordage, with just twisting it a bit better. How far we've traveled, how far have we walked? Uh, how, how, <laughs> how, much, how much have we covered? We've covered decongestants for about five or six edibles, about four or five crafting plants. This is all our, all our The Casalinas are what's called allelopathic, which is plants that inhibit the growth of other plants by some mechanism, right? So if you look at the ground, you see all these pine needles here that have come off the Casalina, the river oak. And we're not really seeing it here properly because we've only got one or two, but normally in the bush you would get like a, a dense mat of these these needles uh -huh. or leaves. I suppose needles technically the wrong, wrong name. Uh, and that's allopathic, okay? Okay, so that's the, one of the plant's mechanisms for survival. The blue ones are So nice. wa wandering Jew yeah. is not really nice. what this is, yeah? It's not wandering. I have seen some gardening books where they have referred to this as wandering Jew, but uh -huh. again, that's the thing with common names. They are often very misleading, right? Generally, this is referred to, and mm -hmm. the common name would be scurvy weed. Oh, all right. Ah, and wandering Jew is Triscantia fluminescens. This is Commelina sciatica. It's, it's similar. It's in the same family, Commelinaceae. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is quite a successful genus of plants throughout the world. So it's got a few things going on. One, it doesn't actually produce any nectar. This is a really weird thing. So if you actually watch it in nature, mm. uh, the bee will come and it will land and then it'll get like pissed off and then it'll go away and it'll do this mm. thing. Cause it doesn't actually produce any ne nectar, which is kind of weird. And then also it's one of the few true blue flowers um, out there. It's just something you don't see very often. One of the few true blue, blue flowers in nature. Um, the commelina we have here has three petals that are roughly the same size. Most of the other species that you will find, and there's like a heap of them throughout the world, in the Himalayas in America, there's, you know, Virginia, Erecta, there's, they go on forever. That one will be a bit smaller, okay? Um, this one's usually okay to eat raw. Usually I cook it. Uh, the other species are usually a little bit high in exalic acids. 
two things, things, two ways you can tell the difference yeah. between Comalina, okay, that we have here, and mm -hmm. the Triscantia fluminescence. So first thing is the flower is blue, okay, which again is very rare in nature. So it's a true blue flower. The way to remember it is true blue Aussie. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the kind of weird thing. And then this part, this structure of the plant here, mm -hmm. all right, if you kind of look closely, it's actually a little bit hairy, okay? And if you get the Triscantia, that'll be bald, okay? Mm -hmm. You can tell a little bit by the shape of the leaf and by just sort of being experienced with the plants. Uh, the Triscantia is not considered edible. Mm -hmm. So you take that, and this one you'd be get you would get away with feeding it raw, but generally I'd recommend cooking it. Okay, you would cook that. That's basically a spinach substitute. And uh -huh. I, that, what I'll usually do with that is I'll do like scrambled eggs, and I'll just put that in. So this is not much to it. It cooks very quickly. So you just put it in. You're just starting to cook the eggs just in like that. Um, it's called scurvy weed because you know it was used to cure scurvy, like back in the early days of the mm. colonies. And so scurvy is a disease. Yeah which is deficiency in vitamin C. Yeah. All right, with scorpic acid. So that. There's a lot of species in Australia, we get really big ones, and people mm. do crazy stuff like making night time and burning and all kinds of stuff. Uh, named after Joseph Banks, obviously. Uh, he was not a very nice human being, very good scientist. Chrysanthemum monophylla subspecies rotunda, yeah, and it does have an edible berry when mm. it's really, really ripe. It's actually a member of the daisy family, the Asteraceae family, uh, and this is from South Africa, and it was introduced to control uh, the, the sand and subsidence in, in the coastal areas, okay? And when I was researching this, one of the things I found, so this is from South Africa, and it was introduced to Australia. That plant that we looked at earlier, uh, the acacia longifolia that was introduced to south africa from australia for the same reason oh, right. and there's people in south africa who are pulling that out because the acacia is not a native and there's people here pulling this out <laughs> Isn't <the world laughs> and it's like stupid. crazy right it makes no yeah. sense but um yeah um, so it's, it does have an animal not really that useful um but you know it's, it's worth trying if you want to have a little shot at it so this is exocarpus Cupris and formius. Okay. Uh, carpus is a botanical word for fruit. Exo, so, so the, yeah, the, so it kind of looks like a little bit like a cashew. And you got this red fruit, yeah? Uh -huh. It's actually can be really yum. Uh, sometimes it's a really nice and ripe, they, they're really yum. And uh, they did used to make jams out of it, apparently. Mm -hmm. Exo, carpus, cupris, and formius. Uh, cupris and formius, again, because. It looks a little bit like a pine tree, so it's cool, really cool bush trucker plant. Worth taking a photograph and coming back to that one. So we've got a, over here. We've got a low cot, so it's quite a useful tree. So you get these in suburban backyards. They seem to be quite kind of popular in the 70s and 80s. Okay, the fruit's quite nice. Um, the problem with the fruit is it doesn't really have a long shelf life, so it's something you want to freeze or make a jam or preserve. Or possibly next year I'm going to try low cot wine. A really good trick with low cuts is when you get one like this over the fence, you'll get a few self seeders. So there's one up there, there's one right behind us here, there's another one there, and there's another one down the track. So whenever you're kind of in foraging mode and you see a low cut like that, scatter out the local area and you'll find a few more. Because obviously, what's happened is the possums took in the fruit and, uh, you know, right. gone for a little wander. And it's, it's made themselves so seeds. You often find it in areas like this, you'll find four or five in a row. Um, some people do use the seed and make a type of grappa from it. Um, that's possibly a little bit controversial because this is a member of the Rosanese family, botanical name is Arabotria japonica. And most of the seeds in the Rosanese family can contain a little bit of cyanide. Uh, you can actually make a tea from the leaf as well. Q. Paniopsis anacodonides, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, this does have an edible fruit, right? Uh, it's ed edible, but it's not particularly palatable, okay? Mm -hmm. Talking earlier about windbreaks and using uh, cypress pine as windbreak, this is an incredible tree for that kind of thing. It's incredibly kind of resilient. It'll just take a lot of damage, 
It's a really cool Australian native tree. You get it a lot in coastal areas. And it's, if you want to do any kind of landscape, windbreak. Cardinal Spurnum Australi. So this is a really significantly important tree in Australia. Uh, and this tree feds thousands of Australians. I don't know how long, you know, thousands of years. Um, and it's a really good kind of um, example of indigenous agriculture, okay? Which is sort of something that hasn't really been talked about too much in the past, uh, but something that we're just becoming more aware of in our society of how in traditional times people like uh, manage the land. And this tree is an example of this. Um, so in the modern era, we have kind of like, you know, phylogenetics where we can analyze DNA and we can see what trees lead each other, each other tree. Uh, and this, you know, had been traded and passed around amongst indigenous people uh, for generations, yeah. So it's a little bit of a tricky one to use and I really wouldn't recommend it, but how it would be done and obviously like we're a little bit late in the season right so this one is obviously sprouted so you've got this is in the the pea family the fabinaceae okay so we've got where's the shell there we go so we've got the shell there so you open up the shell and you usually got between two three or four seeds mm -hmm. yeah it's called the plumule it's called the radical that's the seed so these were deliberately planted, all right, mm -hmm. by traditional and traditional uh -huh. times okay. as a form of agriculture. And we know that because mm -hmm. we can kind of trace the information through the DNA. And what you would do with this one, uh, and it, I haven't done it, but I've read up on it. Um, it contains a few toxins, which are kind of like a little bit nasty to you. And you have to kind of leach out those toxins in the seed. So you would grate this. That you'd make a little bag with some of the plants that we looked earlier like the lamandra mm. or the flax lily mm -hmm. you'd make a little bag and you soak it in running water okay and then you would get rid of those toxins and then you would mm. be able to make something out of it okay like i say i haven't this is quite an involved process um, a lot of people have suggested there's little bits of knowledge that have been lost with that and some people have had problems who's tried it mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of australian history uh, it's a very, very significant tree, and you know it was just traded for a long time. 